We don't have Carlos's rage. Yeah, where is, I know. Where's the rage? I know. We of really Carlos need. Lozada? I'm, I'm missing the sizzling the, hot the toxic Carlos masculinity. Lozada takes. Yeah. Lozada spice. As as Jimmy Carter wrote in his oh, 25th no. memoir. <laughs> Jimmy Carter lusted in his heart. He did lust in his heart. Uh, Jimmy. From New York Times Opinion, I'm Michelle Cottle. I'm Ross Dowsett. And I'm Lydia Polgreen. And this is Matter of Opinion. All right, my friends, it is Gender Week on Matter of Opinion. Oh, boy. I know, right? I'm gonna hear. Let me hear something. You'll hear notice. Something. You'll notice that Carlos has uh, tragically found some other, other important commitment to carry him away from us. Yes, he is sadly out this week. And let's be clear: I have promised him he will be punished, but we will soldier on nonetheless. And today, we're going to talk about how gender shapes our political choices and the world. Dun dun dun. <laughs> So a new article just came out showing that men and women are getting more and more politically divided, especially among Gen Z. So first, I want to go back in time a bit. And I'm curious whether you all remember a gender political split growing up. I mean, were your parents of similar political persuasions? Uh, Mine absolutely were. And my parents' parents absolutely were, Um, at least on on the American side. I don't know about the Ethiopian side. There were lots of things that were happening there that could turn things topsy-turvy. But both of my grandparents were kind of stalwart. Goldwater Republicans, you know, big fans of Ronald Reagan, conservative diehards. And all of their children became very liberal Democrats. And my mother, once she became an American, was also a very liberal Democrat. All right, Ross, what about you? Yes, I mean, basically the same. Um, We were sort of all good Bill Clinton Democrats when I was little. And then by the time I was a teenager, they were sort of conflicted Democrats with some conservative leanings. And sort of in terms of overall family dynamics on both sides of the family, almost everyone was a Democrat, which made my, you know, (laughs) my my ideological evolution has, you know, remained. You just went rogue, didn't you? Every day my father wakes up and looks in the mirror and says, Mm -hmm. how did it come to this? (laughs) See, uh, my father can sympathize, though. Yes. No, I I know. So you too, right, Michelle? You grew up, you know. Oh, yeah. My parents were both good conservative, like culturally conservative Republicans. This this wasn't a case of like economic conservative and social liberalism. They were down the line conservatives and, and still really are. So, yes, much like the Douthat parents, my parents are just not entirely sure of where they went wrong with me. But, you know, in general, for decades in the U.S., there has been, not necessarily within families, but at least a slight political gender gap with women voters leaning more liberal, more democratic than the men do. But in recent years, that gap has widened and overwhelmingly because of younger women moving left. So... There's been a lot of chatter about this of late. Who wants to kind of break down this latest argument that Gen Z in particular is facing a, quote, great gender divergence? Yeah, I mean, this has been sort of a, as you said, Michelle, there's been a sort of real gender gap in especially U.S. voting for many election cycles. Women more likely to vote for Democrats, men more likely to vote for Republicans. And Over the last few years, there's been some evidence that there's an actual divergence happening here where Gen Z women are still becoming more liberal, becoming more liberal more rapidly than in the past with maybe an inflection point around the Me Too era. We can get into what the actual inflection point might be. And men are either remaining a little bit more conservative or becoming a bit more conservative still. Um, Now, As with everything involving social science research, there's debates about how big a split this is, how real it is, how big the split is depends on which data set you use. But the most recent entry into this discussion was a a big piece by the Financial Times writer John Byrne Murdoch that looked at this trend across a bunch of different countries and found pretty similar trends in the U.S., Germany and the United Kingdom and South Korea. So I think we have enough evidence at this point to say that, you know, how big it is is open to debate. But in Gen Z, there's a real male-female divergence that's different from the gender gap of 
the up till the recent past. So, Lydia, does this seem on point to you? I mean, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I think, you know, it's interesting, right, because the global nature of it is really fascinating. I mean, you know, look at Poland, for example, which has sort of like taken a turn back towards more kind of liberal democracy in its most recent election. But among men 18 to 21, almost half of their votes went to the kind of hard right confederation party, which is compared to just a sixth of the women in the same age bracket. And that's not the populist right party that has no. governed Poland and inspired a lot of no. angst among Western liberals, yeah. what deserve it or not. That's the further right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so I think you're definitely seeing something that is real, right? And then there are just sort of other trends like, you know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Men are on YouTube, women are on TikTok. And, you know, that takes them on these is that true? sort of very yeah, men spend much, much more time on, on YouTube and women spend much, much more time on TikTok. And that takes them on very different journeys. So I do think that there are all of these ways in which men and women are diverging in their cultural tastes, in their life sort of aspirations and things like that. So, of course, it seems very natural that that would show up in politics. Well, it does strike me that it's a, something as a global trend that always makes it more of a challenge to tease out the root causes. I mean, what do you guys see as, aside from the media ecosystems, which these days we can blame almost anything on echo chambers and ecosystems and bubbles. And and I think it's partly true. But what are some of the other major trends that you both see driving this, either in the U.S. specifically or abroad? Well, to get back to your initial point, Michelle, where you were talking about our parents and grandparents and their usually fairly shared politics, there's one basic chicken and the egg question, which is this is linked in some way to declining marriage rates and declining rates of relationship formation. So if you look, for instance, just at American voting behavior, the gender gap is actually often a marriage gap where married women are more likely to vote for conservative parties and single women are much, much, much more likely to vote for liberal parties. So in a way, it's you could say, well, it's not surprising that as marriage rates go down, men and women diverge more politically because marriage is often the way that people bring their worldviews into alignment. But then you could argue it the other way and say, no, it's that the divergence is making the marriage rate go down, right? <laughs> because And so you have all these stories about, again, it's usually liberal women saying they don't want to date conservative men, although you don't have to go very far on the internet to find conservative men saying that they don't want to date. <laughs> they don't want to date um, Taylor Swift. They, well, uh, we, <laughs> yeah, we, we'll, we'll get in, We should get into that. But, no, I'm right. getting into Taylor. So, so, the, so that's just an example of how clearly this trend is bound up in some way with the decline of marriage and even the decline of romantic and sexual relationships. But what is driving what is a little bit unclear. Yeah, I fall down on the side of the more kind of women have become independent financially and have more freedom. It's it's not that they dislike men. It's just that they get choosier. I mean, I have stories floating around my own family about in the generations above me, if only X had had more financial freedom, she would have left her husband. Right. No, I think I think that's exactly right. And I think, you know, it's worth dwelling for a moment on how recent a lot of the changes to women's lives in the United States in particular are. I mean, we're just barely a century removed from the passage of the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote. Women needed permission from their husbands to open a bank account. It really wasn't until 1974, which is the year before I was born, that women were guaranteed the ability to open a bank account without their husband's permission. Um, marital rape was only made illegal nationwide in 1993. That was my first year of college. Wow. So, you know, the idea that, like, women's bodies were the property of their husband and they could do with them what they would, um, you know, that has only fairly recently been banished. Of course, you know, birth control, not very old, abortion access via row, divorce laws liberalized. They started in the 1960s. So the idea that women had some choices about how they were going to live their lives in the public sphere is a really, really, really new thing in the grand scheme of how societies get made. 
And I think the massive, massive accelerant of the past few years is, of course, and Ross alluded to this, the Me Too movement, which I think went off like a bomb and created a lot of questions about how much progress had actually been made over the last century as as women sort of came into public life. And, And then, of course, the other thing that's much, much more recent, but I think has a potentially even more seismic effect on American politics is the fall of Roe and what seems to be an aspiration to take on birth control, um, you know, take on no-fault divorce and all of these things that to a lot of women seem aimed at rolling back the clock. And, you know, look, one of the best definitions of conservatism is like a kind of backward-looking politics, right? I mean, let's return. Let's go back. Let's, And women look back and they're like, I don't want that. That's not a life that I'm aspiring to. So that's my sort of grand analysis and theory. Ross, go. No, I mean, I I think to some degree I agree. Certainly the scale of economic independence that young women experience today has no parallel in really in human history as, as far as we can tell. So you would expect that to change dating norms and romantic norms in in ways that then interact with people's political perspectives. I think the more specific you get to American politics, the harder it is to explain the global trend. So the fall of Roe happens in 2022. But if you're looking at the chart on the ideology gap in South Korea or Germany, the big inflection point is really somewhere in the mid-2010s. But I think you have sort of deep structural forces, the economic empowerment of women being an incredibly important one. But then you have something, and I think internet life and internet culture has to play some really important role here because Always. like a lot of things changed clearly in the 2010s, you know, sort of changes in mental health, changes in our politics, both Trumpism and the Great Awakening happened sort of in that period. That's why I found the TikTok versus YouTube thing really interesting. There, There's something there about the way the sex has experienced digital life that has to be encouraging alienation from one another. So this speaks to a piece of this that really does concern me, and you may be able to shed a little light on this, Ross. As as a man, you mean? <laughs> no. Oh, well, just okay. glad we have an expert, you know. Yeah. <laughs> as a conservative. So one of the things that worries me is that in many cases, this has the advancement of women, and I don't know if we, we look at it from the Me Too lens or what, is seen as a zero-sum game, which is that it's almost an adversarial thing, like in order for women to kind of flex and and get out from under a lot of these traditional problems, men are feeling put upon. And in some cases, they are being talked about as though they are the problem. And I see this with like my kids' friends, you know, young men in college. I've brought this up before. They just feel like society has decided that young men are just generically a problem. And this then makes them vastly more open to the Andrew Tates, you know, the conservative, misogynistic social media phenomenon. And then the social media stuff comes into play where they can find lots of people just like them who are feeling that way and lots of very cynical media personalities who are making their fortune by whipping up this kind of us versus them sense and the whole, well, they're not letting men be men. I mean, Trump does this to some degree on the presidential trail, but it's this whole adversarial, you are the problem in order for my gender to advance right? Uh, that, they, that young men seem to have absorbed. Well, I mean, it's a weird, we have a very weird cultural moment on this front where on the one hand, if you look at the highest offices in the land, corporate America and so on. Like, most politicians are still men, though there are plenty of female politicians. Most corporate leaders are still men, right? So if you look at that piece of the landscape, you would say, well, yeah, it makes sense to sort of spend a lot of time talking about the empowerment of women and expect men to just sort of suck it up and recognize that they need to give a little ground. But then if you look at, like, who's graduating from college and who's doing well in the workforce in their 20s and 30s, it's much more likely to be women <laughs> yeah. than to be men. So that creates this dynamic where, yeah, if you're a young man and you're looking around you and you go to a good college and the student body is probably more female than male, everyone's wearing, you know, the future is female T-shirts. Like, you have just huge gaps in a lot of places in 
female college completion rates versus male college completion rates and so on. Uh, Yeah, I think it's quite natural for young men to say, well, we have a society organized around the advancement of women, and I'm a man, and in my cohort, like, our role isn't clear, we're blamed for a lot of things, we're slipping behind, who's looking out for me? Sure, but, like, a a few things, right? One thing that was alighted in a lot of the discourse about sort of men falling behind, really, really, really kind of... um, underemphasized or just ignored the sort of racial component of of it. I mean, black men are slipping behind, uh, you know, women in general, but black women in particular at much, much, much higher rates. And some of this data, you know, I think we're thinking of it as like men writ large, but in fact, there's like a tremendous amount of variation depending on class, depending on race and all those kinds of things. Like, you know, affluent white men, I think, are actually doing pretty darn well as well as they've ever done. And I I found some really fascinating uh, research that found that specifically on like, why didn't you complete college? One third of men, like fully a third of them were like, I just didn't feel like it. You know, about a quarter of women gave the same, same response, but it was a significantly higher proportion of men who are just like, eh, I didn't really want to. So I I think that there is this kind of like boo-hoo-hoo, like, you know, what about the men? That it sort of feels like they don't like the vibes rather than not liking the reality. Well, but suppose, okay, but suppose those numbers were reversed, Lydia, right? And it was that women were more likely to say I didn't finish college because I didn't feel like it. And men were more likely to cite a material reason. We would have, you know, a hundred op-eds the next day by people talking about, like, what structural and psychological forces could possibly be leading women to feel like they just don't feel like finishing college. This must be the legacy of patriarchy embedded in the structure of college that makes women feel like the vibes don't work for them. And if we need to overthrow patriarchy, we need to change the vibes, <laughs> no, right? But, 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 but so no, when it's men we, doing it, you're like, oh, boo-hoo, you, no, you were lazy no, no, no. and we, wanted we, to we, drop we, out and, you know, we watch lived TV. Through, we lived through a huge news cycle of hand-wringing about all of this boys and men stuff. We just read about it endlessly. Like, I just don't, like, I don't. Yeah, I mean, I, there I, were I, like, like five, but, there were like five oh, pieces. No, and, come on, you know, Ross. Yeah, don't don't yes, be silly. Yes, no, it's true. After decades of a particular narrative, people looked around and said, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> men, men don't seem to be doing that But well. again, yes. like, after millennia, a millennia of living under the oldest and most, you know, durable hierarchy, which is the hierarchy between men and women, right? Like, so, I, I mean, like, if we're counting time, right, there's been a lot less time that we've been thinking about women's freedom, women's empowerment, women's ability to exist in the world separate from men. So this is all, like, relatively new. And the reaction from, you know, boys and men to that emerging power of women has gotten, but, I would say, a disproportionate amount uh, well, of Well, perhaps, but like the 20, I mean, again, like, just since I'm here to represent, you know, the 21-year-old <laughs> male, right? Represent, my friend. Fly that flag. Well, the 21-year-old male might say, well, what does the umpteen millennia of patriarchal subjugation of women have to do with me? I was not around for coverture laws. I was not around in medieval France or 8th century Arabia or wherever else. (laughs) Why is it just that I should be asked to, like, suck it up for the sake of, you know, the advantages that my male ancestors had that have nothing to do with my own life now, right? When we get to the phrase millennial patriarchal subjugation, I'm just going to have to jump in here and and say, I (laughs) do think, I, I do think Lydia's point about the economics is a big one. Yes. And it's also, I think, probably a little bit what we're seeing with the Trump phenomenon, where Trump is actually making a fair amount of headway with young Black and Latino men who are feeling like their white counterparts, in many cases, left behind by the fast-moving culture and are looking for someone who is telling them that he's looking out for them. And so we're entering this weird kind of new dynamic that we haven't seen in a long while, where there's actually the leader of a major party coming out and saying, enough is enough, culture has become too feminized, men kind of rally. Which, just just to to offer a, a global note, if you look at the politics of South Korea, there is, in fact, a much more extreme version of this. Yeah, this is not just Trump. The the right of center party is is much more explicit about saying, you know, feminism. Like, Trump doesn't stand up and say feminism has gone too far. He's vaguer about it. 
but you have... You, it's so hard I, I think, to be a young man in this era. You know, you can't sexually harass women, that sort of thing. But he doesn't say that. No, he did say it. During the Brett Kavanaugh sexual harassment right. hearings, he said, oh, I would hate to be a young man. It's just so hard to get by. <laughs> right. But so we, I'm just saying there's a more overt form of this politics oh, yes. Yes, yes, in yes. the more gender polarized landscape of South Korea. Yeah, but I think there's also just, like, stuff going on with gender and sexuality just more broadly uh, that I think is also a part of this. I was looking at some data from the Public Religion Research Institute that found that 28 percent of Gen Z people, uh, adults and teens, identify as LGBTQ in some form, and that's up from 16 percent of millennials. That's a really, really, really big shift. Now, this data didn't break it down by gender, but so much of the angst about particularly trans kids, I think, centers on transmasculine children and this idea that, like, you know, little girls are rejecting femininity and they're basically sort of choosing either to be transmasculine or to be non-binary. And I feel like that's part of this story, too, is that, like, there's this sense that something just bigger is going on with the ways in which young people think about their gender, their sexuality, all of these things that freaks people out. And I have young adults in my household, and I you see this across the board, just kind of this kind of fluidity that people are talking about. But I want to know, if it's like talking about the gender, the gender split in politics, I want to know how concerned we should be. I mean, is... Is this growing split basically going to destroy human civilization because nobody can get along and get together and have children and the species stops? Yes. These are the questions that are keeping me up at night, Ross. So so after the break, let's get into what all of this means for the future. So we've talked through the causes, or some of the causes at least, of the growing ideological split between men and women. But really, should anyone much care? I mean, uh, what do we see as the looming consequences of this, or are we just blowing it out of proportion? I think it definitely has very significant consequences, right? I mean, like when one half of the population goes in one direction and the other half goes in another, you're going to have friction, you're going to have conflict. I feel as though the answer is always to sort of find ways through, through compromise and through <laughs> sort of finding these these ways to have lives of greater equity, to, like, welcome more women into, like, the public sphere. But, you know, the moment that we're living in right now is one that in some ways, like, sort of pulls in exactly the opposite direction. I was recently having a conversation with someone who's in the business of trying to recruit university presidents, and uh, they told me that not a single woman wants to be a uni new university president right now because everyone mm -hmm. is worried about being torn to pieces, you yeah. know? And, uh, so I think I think that, like, we are living in this moment where it's not just that men are feeling disempowered. I also think that women are like, wait a minute, when we stick our heads above the parapet in, like, meaningful ways, our necks are on the line in ways that, like, may or may not be worth it. So I think that it's possible that even in this moment, you could see a kind of self-considered retreat from public life among certain women, particularly women in powerful positions. Because it's just not worth it. You look skeptical, Ross, my friend. I would I would bet against that. But interesting. I mean, I think that the challenge here, right, is that there's the political challenge that any form of sort of identity based polarization creates problems for society. And we have a lot of different forms of polarization, but the scope of this is sort of novel and we don't know what it will mean for our politics. But then this is also a form of polarization that is literally separating the two populations whose union is necessary for the continuation of the human race. And you heard me reference South Korea repeatedly as a more extreme example of gender polarization in politics. And that's not just sort of an interesting, you know, academic point about a small, rich country in Northeast Asia, because South Korea is also a harbinger in the total and utter collapse of fertility rates. And of course, you know, regular listeners of this podcast know that I am, you know, interested in the problem of birth rates uh, worldwide in the developed world and concerned about the consequences of demographic decline. Modest demographic decline leads to 
slower economic growth, even potentially negative economic growth. It leads to incredible burdens on old age pension systems because you don't have enough younger workers paying into them. And it leads to a lot of alienation and literal physical isolation. So if you look, though, at cases like South Korea, and there are other countries headed rapidly in that direction, we aren't talking about something that's sort of a, you know, interesting sociological and economic question of like, well, what does society look like as it ages and has fewer kids? We're looking at um, the potential for actual crisis and actual collapse. Like South Korea's fertility rate is in the 0.7s right now, which means roughly for every two people, there is 0.7-ish offspring. If you just project that trend forward, South Korea's population doesn't just like diminish, it starts to actually collapse over a like two generation time scale. And you have like huge cities as ghost towns and empty skyscrapers everywhere and not enough people to, you know, staff the armed forces of South Korea, which, as we know, have a fairly important job to do, given that they share a peninsula with a lunatic totalitarian regime. <laughs> and so, again, as I said, it's a totally open question how political polarization and declining marriage rates and family formation rates interact, but they clearly are interacting in ways that are accelerating things and turning my slightly crankish ob obsession into what might end up being the most important story of the 21st century. Well, you don't look convinced. No, I mean, I, I think as the one person in this group who, who doesn't have children, I sleep well at night knowing that my brethren in Africa, and the Times has done some great reporting on this, that, you know, that there's just a huge population explosion happening. You know, there are lots of people in the world. There are lots of new people being made in the world. There are lots of people who are living in places where they might not be able to live for very much longer, and they will need to move to new places. And a world in which people are more freely able to move and live together and take care of one another is the world that I want to live in. Less a world in which we're obsessed with, you know, replicating the existing structure of nation states with hard borders and sad 19th century real politique about who lives where and why. So I guess, like, it's it's just not a preoccupation of mine, you know? Um, well, what do you, what, what do we think is going to, like, to just stick with the South Korean example, right? So, yes, it's true that, that South Korea could take the entire population of Mozambique and move it to South Korea, and then, at least for a certain amount of time, it wouldn't have a population problem. Even in sub-Saharan Africa, birth rates are declining, and sub-Saharan Africa is, at this point, the only region in the globe that has serious above replacement fertility. It's not something where there's like a first world that isn't having kids and the rest of the world is. Uh, birth rates in Latin America are going down. Generally, it's down below two. In some places, it's as low as 1.4 or 1.3. So what is your answer for encouraging people to have children? Because the progressive answer is often, well, you need to make the social safety net better. But the social safety net in Europe is pretty damn good. And they're not having kids either. And you can say, well, get everybody back in church and put women back in their place, which seems to be the answer on the far right. That's really not an option either. So I think what we're looking at here is why are people not having kids? And a lot of the reasons are very good ones. And if you just look at the U.S., the answer is in part because having kids is hard and thankless and used to be that's just what women did. Now, I happen to think having kids is also one of the most fantastic human experiences. And if you miss out on it, then you, you know, you, you make a different choice and that's fine. But you you got to address the fact that it's not really just economic and you're not going back to the, you know, 1650s. So how do you address it from that perspective? Well, maybe maybe Ross wants to go back to the 1650s. There are people I, I do not <laughs> no. wish to go back to the 1650s. Not specifically. I, I mean, I think basically when the problem is your birth rate is, you know, 1.5 and it would be better if it was 2, then it's a sort of somewhat normal policy problem and you can argue about what kind of social safety net you should have. And in those arguments, I have sympathies with 
liberals. I, I su- I'm one of the conservatives who favors the you know new child tax credit provisions that Congress is considering this week. Those things have the potential to make it economically easier to have and rear kids, and they can affect the birth rate on the margins. But there are clearly just deeper, profound cultural forces at work here, which is why this trend shows up everywhere. It's not just an East Asian problem. It's a European problem. It's an American problem. You know, you can have conservative governments. You can have liberal governments. There is something about high-tech late modernity that is deeply, deeply anti-natal, anti-birth. And there is a problem here that is deeper than policy, and I'm not, I don't offer a profound solution for it, except that, like, It is worth taking it seriously as a problem. But I also think that there's still this kind of broken bargain around this sort of relationship between women and men. Like, are women going to pay a disproportionate price for childbearing in terms of their economic potential? Are they going to pay a disproportionate price in terms of their ability to pursue other outside interests and friendships and things like that? And I think that those are things that I hear from my friends who are making decisions about whether or not to have kids or whether or not to have another child. It's not just economic. It's also about the sort of classic battle of the sexes stuff. Yeah, the latter is what I worry more about because, as noted, there's lots of different countries with lots of different social safety nets, and none of them have solved this problem. What we have is the old social contract was very clear. Men went out and earned the money, took care of that part. Women stayed home and did the family. That doesn't hold, at least in the U.S. anymore. And so we have not yet found a better balance until that new contract becomes clearer, of course you're going to have a lot of ambivalence. I, I agree that there is, a, there is a failure to develop a model of male-female relations that balances the expectations of a more egalitarian and feminist society with the fact that women get pregnant and men don't. And you do, in fact, need some kind of balance where The man in many relationships does end up doing more work outside the home because he's not the one bearing the children, right? Oh, oh, let's be clear. It's not the pregnancy. It's the raising of the children. I mean, the pregnancy sucks, let's be clear. It's also the pregnancy, right? If you have three kids— But that's nine months. Well, it's actually 10 months. They lie to you, right? That's true. It's 40 (laughs) weeks. But I I also think that we've been talking about this all exclusively in the context of the nuclear family. And I think that there have been times and places in society where much broader networks of kinship, of community, have had responsibility for raising of children and also of, like, keeping marriages going. And, like, the thing that's interesting to me is, like, I have a lot of queer friends who have gone to extraordinary lengths in order to create families. And those families have different bonds of kinship. So I do think that there is a sense of, like, possibility and we could build, you know, a different and and better world and different kinds of communities. Some of them are things that we recover from the past. Some are things that we will build anew. But I guess, like, I I think that part of the the problem is, like, we're viewing this in a very kind of, like, narrow lens of the nuclear family. And the nuclear family, like, has not been so amazing for women, right? (laughs) Well, if you think the nuclear family is not amazing for women, there are a lot of family models that have been a lot less amazing for women in history. So beyond the birth rates and the collapse of humanity. There's nothing beyond I deny our interest in other things. Like we (laughs) as we know it. Yes. Beyond that. Are we concerned about any any fallout? Now one of the things that I'm thinking of is we used to always talk in terms of The split between the genders was different than, say, segregation with race or ethnicity because men and women couldn't really separate to the degree that different races could because they had to come together and get married and make families. But they can just increasingly operate in two different spheres that could accelerate this split. So it's interesting to think about, like, what does the Internet do here when these some of these figures about the gender split were being talked about you had some people weighing in and saying well this just shows that the internet has separated men and women so completely that they don't even interact with each other anymore and then someone else said well actually it's not quite that it's that the internet separates men and women into these virtual spaces but the virtual spaces are transparent to each other 
so that women can see what the men are talking about and oh, men can Jesus. see what the women are talking about exactly. And that's, in a way, the worst of both worlds. The sexes are separating, but they're watching each other separate. They aren't liking what they see because that's, right, you know, like, there's no women, <laughs> reason women would oh like what they God. see in all male spaces, right? And so that's, that's I don't We've know. We've gotten a look inside the locker room is what you're telling. There is this kind of, and, you know, we said we weren't going to talk about Taylor, and um, and I always forget the, the football player's name because, um, you know. Travis Kelsey. Travis, yeah. I think that there's also this weird normalcy gap between, like, what women are into and what men are into. I, I Like, <laughs> I just, like, I mean, think about it. Like, women are, like, hmm. on Pinterest and, like, men are on Discord, you know? Like, Pinterest is, I like— I don't know what Discord is. Well, I, I definitely know what Discord is, but I'm an unusual, unusual woman. But I think, like, you know, Ross wrote a column about just how freaking weird the, like, bizarre conspiracy theories about Taylor and Travis are. You know, here you have— this absolutely beautiful young woman doing exactly what we historically have wanted young women to do, which is, like, date a super hot athlete, you know? Very manly. Very manly. manly. And, like, they seem super into each other. They're making out all the time. And, like, the right is going apeshit. I mean, they're just like, this is a psyop, you know? And so... (laughs) And, like, I guess I just, like, I think that, like, to me that, and this maybe takes it a step away from what Ross was arguing, it just sort of, like, highlights just how freaking weird the right in general has become. And so it's, like, if it's, like, Pinterest versus Discord, sign me up for Pinterest. Well, it's not really gender so much as just freaky paranoia, right, though? Like, Marjorie Taylor Greene was a, a fan of Q for a while. I have some thoughts on the weirdness, the weirdness of the left that I will save for oh, a future, no, a future conversation. <laughs> but since since I wrote it, I agree that part of the right, especially the male right, has gotten trapped in what you might call a kind of spiritual inceldom, where you are so obsessed with the perfidy of women in becoming liberal and feminist and so on, that when one of the, not one of, the most famous woman in the world is sort of doing the most heteronormative thing imaginable, you're like, oh, as this has got to be fake. They're, you know, it's they're, they're they're pulling the wool over our eyes again. Sure, she loves that football player. Who could possibly believe that? It's a problem. This has all brought us back to Rush Limbaugh's feminazis. Feminazis. It's all a big circle. But I also think that, and this is, you know, Russ in, invoked the I word incel, and, like, I think that that's an important part of this whole conversation. This, like... There are men out there who think that they have the right to, like, date the most attractive woman in the world. They think that Taylor Swift should somehow be in their league. And, like, that, that I just, you know, we, we had a series of, like, horrible mass shootings by men who were like, no one will have sex with me. And I, I, I just, I feel like there's something very rotten, very rotten I think this is what we have to take there. away from this. It's all yeah. about sex. It all comes back to sex. Well, well, yes, because that is how the human race continues to exist, and I would just like to point out that it is characteristic that, like, you know, I basically described to you both the looming apocalypse of the developed world, (laughs) and at the end of the show, we were like, okay, fine, but, you know, what does it mean for partisan politics in the U.S.? There's only so much we can worry about the birth rate this month, Ross. Okay. (laughs) You're doing your part. God bless you. Um... (laughs) When the bears roam through the empty canyons of New York City, <laughs> I'll be long you'll gone. Remember this conversation and left no heirs. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to leave it there for this week with bears roaming Manhattan. And when we come back, we're going to get hot or cold. All right, we are back, and my friends, it is hot, cold time. So who has the take this week? I do, and I I wanted something in keeping with our discussion of marriage, family formation, and birth rates. Um, And obviously, I am am hot on marriage, family, and child rearing in general, you know, saving civilization and so on. But what I am cold on at this time of year, every year— is uh, the fact that through the workings of divine providence, three of my beloved children have birthdays within nine days of one another every year. Ouch. So we we call this birthday alley. One is down, two to go, although by that I just mean the sort of handing out of 
presents and cake blowing out. Uh, The idea of like birthday sleepovers and birthday parties, (laughs) those are still floating around us as they do every year. People ask us sometimes if, you know, did we did we plan it this way for simplicity? And the, the answer is no. Um, <laughs> How would that be simpler? God, my no. recommendation is if you if you are, a, you know, if you are the kind of person who somehow manages to plan your childbearing incredibly efficiently, <laughs> space the birthdays, oh. space the birthdays. You know, you could be more efficient and just have one big party. Now, they would be talking about that to their therapist forever. But I, it, I, it would look, be more efficient. If I, speaking of like the decline of patriarchal authority, if I were in charge, uh, right? If I, if I were society. running things, yeah, there would be one joint party. They'd each get a, a present, you know, but my... My soft-hearted wife, you know, it's like, oh, they all they all need their own. They all their deserve own their special, special day. Special day. Everybody gets a trophy. I mean, what is a birthday if not the participation <laughs> trophy? <laughs> of, Congrats of, on, of, on, on achieving something that you didn't even right, have a part right, of. Right, <laughs> Okay, and on that harsh Gen Z note, we're we're gonna close for the week. Thanks, guys. Till next week. See you soon. Bye. Thanks for joining us today. Be sure to give Matter of Opinion a follow on your favorite podcast app and leave us a nice review while you're there to let other people know why they should listen. And we know if you're a Gen Z listener that you may have been shouting into your headphones at this. So please feel free to shout at us instead. Leave us a voicemail at 212-556-7440 with your thoughts, reactions to all this data and our conclusions. You can also shoot us an email at matteropinion at nytimes.com. This episode of Matter of Opinion was produced by Phoebe Lett, Sophia Alvarez-Boyd, and Derek Arthur. It was edited by Alison Bruzek and Jordana Hochman. Our fact check team is Kate Sinclair, Mary Marge Locker, and Michelle Harris. Original music by Isaac Jones, Afim Shapiro, Carol Sabaro, Sonia Herrero, and Pat McCusker. Mixing by Carol Sabaro, Audience Strategy by Shannon Busta and Christina Samuluski. Our executive producer is Annie Rose Strasser. <laughs> <laughs>